Hello, STR community. Uh, my name is Tim Folta, and I'm STR division chair. And today I'm so pleased to help launch our virtual symposium series. And this series is a key cog in our new efforts to go beyond the annual conference in building a vibrant intellectual community. While today's symposium features, features corporate and international strategy, we have virtual symposia forthcoming in each of our eight research tracks. Plus, uh, there's also a research sim method symposium, as you can see. So, so there should be a symposium of, in of interest for, for nearly all STR members and a special shout out to our executive committee members and officers past and present who volunteered to organize these efforts. Note that all these uh, symposia and the content that they contain will be asynchronously available through our divisional YouTube channel. So please push your colleagues and doctoral students to this channel. Uh, also, uh, you should be aware that the STR division has a whole portfolio of virtual offerings throughout the year uh, for your benefit. Uh, for example, to aid your intellectual development and networking, uh, we will offer teaching PDWs, meet the scholar sessions, regional paper workshops in Chile, Turkey, and Australia, and PhD networking events. And for STR members hoping to engage others in the community, we have scheduled exercise groups and game nights and cultural cafes and other things. For example, just this morning, we confirmed a forthcoming Scandinavian cafe. So events are being added continuously. So please see our divisional calendar and sign up to our social media channels to stay informed. So these efforts, uh, we believe, are certainly important during these challenging times to keep you connected to a vibrant community that cares about your professional development. However, they also reflect our strong belief that the annual conference is only one way to nourish our members. So with this background on the happenings in the division, it's wonderful that Asim Kaul has put together an outstanding symposia on a topic fundamental to the field, corporate strategy. So thanks uh, for attending this session. And of course, our panelists have our special appreciation. We look forward to learning from you about this important topic. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Tim, uh, and uh, you know, I, 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 I really, I really want to thank the, the speakers. They're the ones doing the hard work uh, of actually presenting. I, I literally sent an email to each one of them and said, hey, do you want to do this? And they said yes. And that was the sum total of my supposed organization. So that's all I'm contributing here. Uh, and in that spirit, I'm going to get out of the way uh, and I'm going to let Emily take over and, and present her paper. Uh, and then we'll we'll just go in the order of Emily, uh, Marco, uh, Katie, and Vikas, and then we'll have Marco Giratna come in and give his discussing comments. Uh, and we'll open it up to questions at the end. That being said, though, if you do have questions as we're going as you're as we're going through the presentations, uh, feel free to add them to the chat. And uh, authors, and I know several of. Several uh, of co-authors are there as well. Uh, um, uh, I think James is here, Luis is here, uh, Cassidy is here, um, uh, Mo is here. Uh, and so, you know, uh, uh, you feel free to answer the questions in chat or feel free to just hold them, hold on to them and we'll try to get to them at the end. Uh, and of course, uh, a huge thank you to the 65 or 60, well, 68 minus eight of you who don't have to be here and are here anyway. Uh, it's really wonderful to see, to see all of you. And I will uh, at some point uh, stop us and, and take a group photograph, but I'm gonna wait uh, until maybe after a couple of presentations. 
Uh, okay, so now I'm really going to get out of the way and let Emily take over. Emily, all yours. Thanks, Asim. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen here. So thank you so much to Asim and Tim and Gwen and everyone for uh, helping to organize this. It's uh, great to get to engage with uh, the community here. Uh, I feel like these kinds of opportunities are, are few and far between these days. So it's really nice to, to have this, uh, this opportunity. Um, I'm also really pleased to present this paper. This is uh, really kind of the maiden voyage for, for this project. We finally have uh, a, a draft of this working paper together. Uh, this is co-authored with my doctoral student, one of my doctoral students, James McGlinch, uh, who's here on the call. Uh, and we're both really excited about this, uh, this project, really marrying together um, you know, my research agenda, um, partially on divestitures, but also uh, James's research, uh, uh, which is especially centered in kind of transaction cost economics uh, and his vast experience in investment banking as well were really important to this project. So um, this paper is entitled Intra-Shift Information Costs, Transition Services Agreements in Corporate Spinoffs. So um, we're starting, as I, as I just mentioned, from kind of a TCE backing here. Uh, and we all know kind of the familiar layout that you know, firms select to organize transactions among three, among three governance modes, markets, hierarchies, and hybrids uh, in terms of economizing transaction costs. Um, we also know that there are shifts between these governance modes uh, due to various conditions, right? So if we think about the shift from hierarchy to market, we can imagine uh, changing market conditions, misalignment of incentives, and very crucially for this study, uh, high information asymmetry. And so one thing that's been uh, established, especially kind of drawing on this informational perspective is that uh, studies that are looking at uh, these governance shift from, shifts from hierarchy to market really find uh, an improved disclosure quality, uh, more detailed filings, uh, increased increase cash flow clarity and uh, reduced equity market discounting all due to these kinds of lower lower information asymmetries that happen following these uh, these kinds of shifts from from hierarchy to market. So um, one thing that James and I uh, in thinking about this started to realize was that you know if we think about this intermediate period, as we're going from this uh, change of governance mode from hierarchy to market, that there still might be the potential for uh, significant information asymmetries kind of in the intra-shift period. So as opposed to uh, ex ante when we're still in, uh, in the hierarchy or ex post when we're still in the market. And there are a number of reasons why we might expect this, right? So one is that there's still a lack of information availability uh, based on what was actually going on within, uh, within the organization. There could be um, you know, unique or difficult to understand strategies. This is a great paper, uh, the Benner and Raganathan paper. And even further, just tightened information ass assimilation costs, right? That it's difficult for uh, external participants to actually assimilate information about what is actually going on uh, within, within the organization. So all of these factors might contribute to the presence of intra-shift information costs, which is really the core concept that we're trying to uh, introduce in this, uh, in this project. And so what we're looking at here then is, can we mitigate this, uh, this information asymmetry during the intra-shift period using voluntary disclosure? And so by voluntary disclosure, we mean the provision of information beyond sort of uh, standard regulatory requirements like GAAP and SEC rules, where that information might be useful to uh, the users of uh, the, the decision making of the users of that information. And you know, there's, there's a pretty large body of literature on voluntary disclosure, uh, showing it to be associated with larger analyst following, uh, more accurate uh, analyst forecasts. But crucially, a lot of this literature has really focused on either um, disclosure in this, uh, this uh, kind of hierarchy state of the world or the market state of the world. So once again, we're really thinking about this idea of voluntary disclosure during this intra-shift period. So to get at these ideas, uh, we turn to the corporate spinoff content, which actually has some really useful features, both in terms of the transactions themselves, but also the disclosures that companies make to try to understand and unpack uh, both the idea of intra-shift information costs, but also uh, how voluntary disclosure might start to mitigate that. 
So um, a corporate spinoff, if you've ever heard me speak, you've heard me give this definition, uh, are transactions in which an existing company divests a business unit through uh, a pro rata share distribution to create uh, an independent publicly traded company, uh, which we'll call Spinco. And so the reason that spinoffs are useful in terms of trying to unpack these intra-shift information costs is, first of all, that in previous work, we've seen these characterized as governance shifts from hierarchy to market because we're taking an existing business unit that operates within the hierarchy, within the parent company, and moving it to an independent entity, right, the market. Second, uh, that there are... Uh, there's a lot of information information asymmetry, as I'll talk about in a minute, during this shift as we think about the spin-off process. And then third of all, because we can see, and this is really kind of the, the, the core phenomenon that we're looking at in this paper, that companies have very heterogeneous disclosure practices when it comes to this intra-shift period in terms of actually disclosing information about that spin-off process. So we're going to look at these transition services agreements as a way of getting into voluntary disclosure and helping to mitigate uh, these information, uh, intershift information costs. So transition services agreement, let me give a little bit of information about these. So these are contractual agreements in which the parent company is agreeing to provide specific services to the spinoff company for a certain period of time after the completion of a spinoff, so as to allow the spinoff company to basically start off functioning on its own and maintain its business continuity. Um, not all companies disclose these, right? So there's heterogeneity and disclosure practices. And typically these TSAs include three key components. First is who's providing the services to whom. Second is what kind of services are being provided. And then third is how long are we actually going to provide, um, provide, these, um, provide these services for. And so sometimes there's information about the costs, but not always. It's actually a little bit sparser in terms of the actual cost of providing these, uh, these services. So to give an example of what I mean here, this is actually one where we do have kind of cost information. So uh, this is Abbott Laboratories spinoff of Abdi uh, from 2016. So as you can see, um, all of these functions basically were what Abbott was agreeing to provide Abdi uh, during this, uh, this transition period. We can see the duration of time for which uh, Abbott is actually going to provide these services. And here we actually have kind of the cost of doing so. So this is uh, not an insubstantial amount of money, as you can see, uh, and, and time in terms of what's actually being provided in this transition service agreement. So um, we have three hypotheses in, the, in this paper. Um, the first is that by uh, providing a connection between the ex-ante, information about a connection between the ex-ante hierarchy relationship and the ex-post market relationship, we actually have kind of information disclosure that's happening uh, by virtue of these TSA agreements and uh, really kind of addressing, you know, sort of what might be unclear about um, the, the standalone functioning of the spinoff company as an independent entity, which has been shown to be associated with equity market discounting. And so our first hypothesis is that uh, when there's disclosure of these TSA agreements, we're going to see that parent companies have higher announcement returns than when there is not disclosure of these agreements. Uh, second of all, we think about the functions. So uh, we can dis distinguish between two different types of function categories, uh, those that are <clears throat> related to transaction governance, where we're thinking about things like finance and accounting, human resources, legal and regulatory, versus those that are related to kind of the business operations. And so our hypothesis here is that the transaction specific uh, functions are the ones that are going to be uh, even more favorably associated with uh, announcement returns to, uh, to these spinoffs, right? So in other words, the companies that are disclosing information about uh, the functions that are specific to the governance of uh, the spinoff itself are gonna have higher, uh, higher announcement returns than those that don't. Um, and then third of all, um, we can think about duration, right, because we have information here on this. And so um, we can imagine that uh, longer duration uh, TSAs are going to uh, kind of increase the horizon over which information is available and useful to uh, investors in the, uh, in the parent company, as well as how easily they're going to be able to uh, kind of assimilate information about the transaction as well during this period. And so our hypothesis here is that the longer the duration of the TSA, the higher the announcement returns uh, to these uh, transactions. 
So let me tell you briefly about the data and results. I want to be mindful of the time here. Um, so we have kind of a 10-year panel of uh, spinoffs, 192 transactions undertaken by seven, 173 parent companies. Um, we see a lot, of, uh, a lot of disclosure here of these TSAs. So 124 out of the 192 include uh, disclosed. Um, and they're pretty widely dispersed over different industries here. So um, we have uh, 41 industries represented at the parent companies and 37 of these industries have uh, kind of disclosed TSAs and similarly for the spinoff firms. So we can see that this is not sort of an industry specific necessarily um, phenomenon that we're really looking at here. It kind of cuts across all of these different industries. So um, the variables, we have uh, announcement returns as the dependent variable. Uh, so we're using cars here. Um, the independent variables, uh, TSA disclosure is a binary variable that just measures whether or not the TSA was disclosed. Um, we distinguish between the uh, kind of transaction monitoring and reporting functions, the governance oriented functions versus the non governance oriented functions and note that these are these are mutually exclusive from one another here. So uh, we can have companies that include both of these in their TSAs, but we're really focusing on this uh, transaction monitoring and re reporting variable as the, the one to really measure hypothesis to. And then um, we have TSA duration uh, as well uh, for hypothesis three, and then a whole host of control variables. Um, for hypothesis one, we wanted to uh, conduct a matching model to uh, try to create a subsample of observationally similar spinoffs that do and don't uh, disclose these, uh, these TSAs. So we use propensity score matching uh, to do that, to generate this match sample, and then uh, ran OLS regressions on the match subsample alone. And then for hypothesis two and three, we have a selection issue in the sense that um, we're going to have information about uh, the characteristics of the TSA, namely the duration and the types of function that, that are included. That means that we need to have um, a TSA in the first place. So we use um, a Heckman model to, to model this kind of selection process. The first stage being, is there a TSA? And then the second stage being, what are the characteristics of uh, the TSA itself? Um, we have an instrumental variable that I'm not going to go through in very great detail here, but I have all the information in the paper if you're interested in learning more. Um, it's basically secure debt in the capital structure, and we're arguing that this is going to be correlated with the decision to disclose a TSA because the TSA might provide information about, will provide information about how uh, the secured debt will be allocated between the parent and the spinoff company, um, but it shouldn't be correlated with announcement returns because there's been a big body of literature that has shown that uh, spinoffs are not associated with wealth transfers from creditors to shareholders. Uh, so we shouldn't see a relationship between sort of the debt characteristics of these transactions with the equity characteristics of the dependent variable here. So that was a very fast explanation, but that's kind of the gist of this, uh, this instrument. And Emily, um, you have two minutes left. Okay, so. yep, thanks, Asim. So um, results really quickly, um, we find support for a hypothesis. Um, we can see that the coefficient on TSA available uh, is positive uh, and statistically significant in this match subsample. And then for hypotheses two and three, we can see that uh, the presence of these transaction monitoring functions uh, are positively associated with the second stage cars, uh, but not so for the, uh, for the non-monitoring and reporting functions. Similarly, longer duration TSAs are also positively associated with uh, cumulative abnormal returns. Uh, and the instrument behaves in the manner that we expected it to as well. So uh, very briefly to conclude, right, the purpose of this project was to try to focus and, and introduce this, this idea of interest shift information costs as opposed to kind of ex ante versus ex post inf information asymmetry. And also to think about how disclosure might start to uh, mitigate these kinds of interest shift uh, information costs. And so we've seen some evidence here in this paper that the disclosure does seem to reduce these interest shift information costs that companies might be experiencing. Um, in terms of contributions, we are speaking to uh, this literature on information asymmetry and voluntary disclosure, uh, as I just said, by introducing this novel concept. Um, we're also kind of contributing here to uh, the literature on the governance of scope reducing transactions by really continuing to conceptualize the parent and spinoff companies as interdependent entities after the completion of a transaction that formally separates them. 
And then last but not least, we're speaking to transaction cost economics uh, in terms of uh, thinking about contractual clauses as a way to not only act as a safeguard as they've been conceptualized a lot in existing literature, but also as an information source that can help to in infuse hierarchy-like characteristics into market governance. So let me stop here. I think I'm just out of time. Um, thank you so much. And I welcome, uh, we welcome any and all comments and questions that you might have. Thanks, Emily. Uh, uh, let's give Emily and, and James uh, found virtual applause. Uh, and, uh, and, and there are already, I think, well, I, shameless self-promotion plug, but there are already some questions in chat. Um, but in the meantime, uh, why don't I invite Marco? Marco, do you wanna share your screen and then present? Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, first of all, thank you so much uh, uh, Asim and to the STR division for uh, organizing this and uh, to Marco for uh, joining as a discussant and taking the time to read our papers. Uh, so this is a, a joint uh, uh, paper with uh, Mariko Sakakibara and Keith Chen from UCLA. And uh, it's about face-to-face uh, -face interactions and the returns uh, uh, to acquisitions. So in this paper, we start from a key problem in, uh, in corporate strategy, which is that uh, firms need to, um, sorry, just give me a second, let me shift this. Okay. Um, the key problem here is that firms need to, um, uh, when, when the firms acquire strategic resources, uh, they need to acquire them in non-competitive markets. Uh, because if they acquire resources in fully competitive markets, then all the rents that uh, are derived from these resources are uh, appropriated by whoever is selling those resources. And there is an established knowledge in the uh, literature on mergers and acquisitions that uh, competition in the market for corporate control tends to be uh, very intense, forcing acquirers to pay a high price for takeovers. And uh, actors and co-authors also uh, tell us that, that um, Competition uh, is often latent. So uh, while uh, acquisitions with multiple observed bidders uh, are rare, it is enough, uh, to, uh, it is enough that uh, some uh, potential buyers are present uh, to force the acquirer to pay a high price for the acquisition. So what can insulate acquirers from competition in the bidding process? What does the, the literature tell us? So we know that uh, uh, an acquirer will be able to profit from an acquisition if it shares some unique complementarities with the target. So if uh, one uh, uh, acquirer can create superior synergies with the target, can outbid competitors and still uh, gain uh, a positive return from the acquisition. We also know that uh, uh, superior uh, information about uh, the target's value or the potential for synergies can uh, benefit the acquirer, allowing it to, to gain some profit from the acquisition. And uh, also we know that uh, the target's management uh, plays a role in shaping how competitive the bidding process is. Uh, this is uh, evident, for instance, in papers that uh, show that uh, um, the target CEO can uh, uh, accept a lower acquisition premium in exchange for uh, private benefits, uh, including cash benefits uh, or um, job retention. So the, the target's management can uh, an agency here regarding on how competitive the process is. So in this paper, we try to uh, contribute to this literature by asking whether social interactions between the targets and the acquirers managers uh, before the acquisition, uh, whether these interactions can insulate acquirers from competition. To build uh, uh, the intuition, consider this uh, statement from practitioners, from uh, many advisors. Uh, they say many, many buyers seek proprietary deals by forming a relationship over a period of time with a, a potential target company, its owners, uh, and management before ultimately making an offer to buy that company. One of the objectives of this approach is to afford no opportunity for other potential buyers to make a competing bid. So you can see that this statement directly speaks to our uh, research question. Now let's try to think uh, what are the theoretical reasons why this statement uh, may be correct. So first, we can think that uh, pre-acquisition um, interactions 
and will shape the target's preference towards uh, uh, the focal acquire. Uh, we know uh, that the target's management uh, can more or less actively solicit other bidders, so they, uh, they can make uh, the acquisition more or less competitive. Um, and we also know that uh, m and are stressful transition for the target's management uh, because uh, the acquisition can threaten the organizational culture of, uh, uh, of the target's management. Uh, they can uh, change their career uh, plans. They can um, uh, also change their status within the company. So we can think that the social interactions may increase the target management trust towards uh, the focal acquirer and therefore reduce the incentive uh, to solicit other bidders. And second, uh, you can also think that uh, um, these interactions will provide more private information uh, to, the, to the acquirer. We know that uh, uh, acquirers face important information asymmetry problems when buying a company, um, that they might not have enough information to evaluate the company, so uh, there are, they, they face a, an adverse selection risk. And uh, we also know that interactions uh, facilitate information sharing. Previous literature typically proxy for interactions with uh, uh, geographical proximity. And therefore, uh, we can expect that other bidders with a weaker relationship with the target uh, will be at a disadvantage because they will have uh, less information and therefore might be reluctant to bid for the target or uh, bid uh, less aggressively uh, if they do. Uh, and this uh, allows the uh, acquirer, the focal acquirer, to uh, pay a price that is lower than a fully competitive auction price. To fix uh, these ideas, uh, consider a, a simple uh, case study. Uh, Duke's, powers, uh, um, Duke's Powers acquisitions of uh, Pan Energies um, in uh, 1996. Uh, press releases after the acquisition revealed that the executives of the two companies uh, visited uh, each other's operations uh, before the acquisition. Uh, they played golf uh, and uh, through these uh, interactions, they uh, found out that uh, they liked each other and they could uh, work with each other. And so they agreed uh, to merge and to share the leadership of the new company. So you can think that when this type of relationship arises, the acquisition process is most likely to take the form of a one-to-one -one negotiation rather than an auction. And uh, on the one hand, uh, Pan Energy, because of this positive relationship, might have uh, less incentive to uh, solicit other uh, potential acquirers. And on the other hand, even if uh, other potential acquirers uh, uh, emerge, Duke Power over time will have uh, accumulated more information about Pan Energy and therefore will be at an advantage. So what happened in this, uh, in this case? Um, it turned out that Pan Energy was uh, acquired um, with a premium of uh, 30% over its stock price four weeks before the announcement, which is actually uh, not a, a bad premium, but it's still uh, about half uh, what uh, the, the average premium that is observed uh, when multiple bidders are present. So based on this uh, intuition, uh, our main hypothesis is that more intense interactions with the target before the acquisition uh, will insulate and acquire from competition in the bidding process. And therefore, interactions will increase the returns uh, uh, the acquirers return from m and And more specifically, we predict that uh, the increase, uh, more interactions will increase the community of Roma returns on the acquired stock at the acquisition announcement. And for public targets for which uh, we, um, we observe the acquisition premium, we can also predict that uh, interactions will uh, reduce the acquisition premium. So we test this uh, uh, hypothesis on a sample of US domestic acquisitions by public companies. Uh, that were announced between July 2016 and January 2018. And uh, uh, to measure uh, interactions, uh, we, we measured the intercompany visits using a smartphone geolocational data. The data comes from uh, SafeGraph. Uh, basically, whenever you have an app that requires access to your location, even if you leave the app open in the background, your phone keeps on sending every five or 10 seconds your location. And the SafeGraph aggregates data from uh, multiple apps, and it covers about 10% of the smartphone users in the US. And this data consists of uh, pings that uh, identify the coordinates of a, a smartphone at a particular uh, moment in time. Smartphones uh, 
are anonymous. Um, and uh, we got uh, for this project data from uh, November 2015 to uh, November 2018. And uh, after we got the data, we verified that the coverage is homogeneous across uh, location, across states uh, and CBSAs. So the first step is to identify the choirs and the target's employees. Uh, so the first thing we do is to geocode the headquarters of the two companies on Google Maps. We then uh, pull the cell phone data that uh, uh, so look like this. Uh, dots here in this figure uh, represent a, a smartphone at a particular moment in time. And then we kept the phones that appeared uh, in the headquarters uh, of the two companies during business hours or business days, excluding uh, moving phones. Once we have uh, identified the two uh, set of employees, we, we count the number of times the acquires of the, um, the, the employees of the acquirer and the employees of the target visited the other company's headquarters uh, in the eight months before the acquisition is announced. And we observe at least one visit for 101 uh, transactions, uh, which is 43% of our sample. We observe both visits from the acquirer to the target and visits from the target to the acquirer. Uh, typically, uh, we observe uh, on average one uh, smartphone per visit. So you don't tend to think about large groups, but most likely um, small groups, uh, perhaps of, uh, of executives, uh, we don't know that. Um, and um, uh, visits tend to occur, start to occur uh, typically from three to four months before the acquisition is announced. Uh, this uh, plot um, shows uh, the distribution of the travel time between uh, merging companies uh, for the uh, sample of acquisition for which we observe at least one visit and for those for which we don't observe visits. You can see that uh, uh, when for local transactions, we almost always observe at least one visit. So uh, geography matters, but we do observe uh, visits also when companies are relatively far away from each other. So this is uh, uh, the baseline uh, regression result on the wireless community of normal returns the acquisition announcement. Our key dependent variable is the number of visits. Uh, we include a number of uh, control variables, a month year fixed effect control for variation in coverage over time. And uh, what we see here is that uh, the number of visits have a positive significant effect on the, the cumulative number of returns. And this effect holds whether we include uh, uh, the travel time between companies. So uh, the fact of visit is separate from effect of uh, geography. And uh, in terms of magnitude uh, here, uh, one standard deviation increase in the number of visits is associated with about 0 0.2 uh, increase in the um, Aquarius returns. Uh, we also find significant effects uh, uh, on the acquisition premium on the subsample of public targets. Uh, here, one standard deviation increase in the number of visits is associated with I want a standard deviation drop in the acquisition premium. Before we can claim, uh, we can make a causal claim, uh, we have to address a, a potential indigeneity uh, concern, which is that acquirers uh, might visit more often targets uh, that are expected to be cheaper or more expensive, and which uh, can induce a upward or downward bias of our coefficient. So what we do, uh, is to use a precipitation, um, so rain or snow, as an instrument for intercompany visits. The idea is that uh, precipitation makes travel more pro problematic due to traffic and delays. And we indeed find that for every uh, pair of companies, our visits are less likely to occur in a day uh, with precipitation. And so uh, we instrument a visit with the number of days with precipitation in the company's locations in the eight months before the uh, announcements uh, being careful to control for uh, industry or location because weather can also capture uh, location. And what we find is that uh, uh, the positive effect of visits uh, uh, on the uh, Aquarius returns uh, holds uh, after instrumenting visits with uh, precipitation days. Uh, the magnitude of the coefficient is similar, slightly uh, greater, um, indicating that maybe um, the OLS regression is underestimating the effect. Uh, my uh, have two minutes left. Okay, okay, just uh, one last uh, slide. And um, uh, so we, in our sample, we have uh, both uh, um, public and private targets. So one question could be uh, what uh, uh, 
whether the effect is stronger for uh, private uh, or public targets. And here we can think about two competing hypotheses. One is that uh, private targets uh, are more informationally opaque and therefore the effect of visits should be uh, stronger because, uh, um, because there is more that can be learned through uh, these visits. And so the, um, we should expect that uh, um, visits will have a more positive effect on the acquired returns. A second competing hypothesis can be uh, formulated by noting that negotiation with private targets uh, are uh, more likely to be one-to-one uh, -one by design. Why is that? So that uh, um, happens because uh, in acquisition of public companies, uh, public companies typically have a uh, provision of a go shop period after uh, an acquisition uh, agreement is signed, so they can uh, go and look for other uh, acquirers. In the case of uh, private targets, uh, this provision is typically not included. So these uh, uh, acquisitions are uh, typically one-to-one -one, uh, negotiations by design. And because our story is that uh, visits will help the acquirer by making the transaction a one-to-one -one negotiation, uh, we, we, expect, uh, we can expect that, that the effect of uh, visits on the acquirer's returns will be weaker for private targets. And uh, in the, empirically, we find the support for the second hypothesis. So the effect of visits is weaker for private targets. So just to conclude, uh, we started from um, this uh, 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 view in the m and literature that conceptualizes uh, m as, com as competitive auctions. And what we argue, uh, in this paper is that the creation of a social connection with the target before the acquisition can insulate the acquire from competition uh, from other latent, latent bidders. So uh, it will make the, trans the, the transaction a one-to-one -one negotiation. And uh, in line with this claim, we find that more intense pre-acquisition interactions are associated with the greater acquires returns. And for public targets uh, also, uh, interactions are associated with uh, uh, lower position premium. So that's it. Uh, thank you so much for listening. And uh, um, let me know if there are questions. Thanks, Marco. Um, there's, again, there's a whole bunch of questions and comments in chat. Let's give Marco a round of applause as well. Uh, and then move on to Katie, who's going to be so single-handedly holding up the international side of this like corporate and international strategy. Katie, all yours. Okay, let me upload my slides here. Um, can you guys see it? Yep. Okay. Um, let me just make sure it's working. And it's not on my machine. Hold on a second. All right. Can you see it now? Yep. Yes, yes. Okay, great. Um, well, I wanna thank you all for having me here today. Um, it is, uh, it's great that you guys are organizing these events. We really find them beneficial. And so uh, thank you so much. Um, my name is Katie Mogelson. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at London Business School. And today I'm presenting the management of innovation in multinational firms. This is joint work with Luis Ballesteros at GW and Cassidy Troyer at uh, London Business School. And so really the motivation behind this study um, is the revolution of technologies that have changed business and the ways in which they're managed. And we focus in particular on broadband technology, which is an information and communication technology, which I'll refer to as ICT uh, here today. So communication is critical for innovation within firms. There are information asymmetries between parents and subsidiaries um, that can dampen productivity. Um, and R&D is increasingly geographically dispersed, which makes it all the more important 
So ICTs actually can reduce information asymmetries. They can improve productivity by lowering the cost of communication. They facilitate knowledge sharing and collaboration and can lead to greater oversight. Um, and um, so the literature generally holds that communication technologies are unambiguously beneficial for innovation outcomes. But we really know little about what happens inside the firm. So are they truly beneficial across all scenarios? And in particular, we may think about how increased communication may not automatically yield benefits. And so brokering knowledge sharing and collaboration requires motivation, time and effort. And there's mixed evidence on the effects of greater oversight on innovation outcomes. So our research question is, does the effect of broadband technology on R&D subsidiaries innovation depend on whether the subsidiary is directly managed by the parent or managed by another subsidiary within the firm. So it doesn't matter who manages the unit. And so we can think about this in terms of the, the incentives of the subsidiaries and the parent, and they both are motivated to enhance innovation for the units that they manage. Um, and ICT in particular uh, can facilitate management through easing the transfer of ideas for project approval and financing, for enabling the managing unit to coordinate knowledge sharing across the group, and for improving monitoring. And in particular, being able to monitor the process of R&D, the inputs of R&D, um, uh, is, is one of the mechanisms through which broadband technology really enables uh, higher quality innovation results. Um, but in terms of parent versus subsidiaries, they have different roles. So the parent has the additional responsibility for the group overall. And this additional responsibility for the performance of the firm can lead to greater information processing constraints of the parent. It may be less likely to take the time to actually coordinate uh, collaboration and knowledge sharing uh, across the units that it's managing. It may be less likely to invest the effort in seeking high quality signals of what the R&D units are doing. So signals of their effort. Maybe more likely to rely on simple financial metrics to assess projects. Um, which we know from existing research, simpler financial indicators actually can constrain innovation outcomes. And so uh, a focus, uh, another aspect of this is that they may be more likely to make more decisions on the R&D projects, uh, which would particularly impact the units that they're managing. So they could use the communication as a tool for control um, and that can actually reduce a unit's discretion and reduce its motivation to integrate new knowledge within the group and to innovate effectively. So this suggests that parents may use the increase in communication to enhance their control and they may not fully leverage the ability for brokering collaboration uh, within the firm. So there are two big challenges with uh, studying this sort of uh, relationship. And the first is that data is really hard to come by. When it comes to how firms organize their innovation efforts, um, one of the issues is that it's generally not made public which units are in charge of which, which means that existing research predominantly relies on surveys, which are snapshots in time, or they use patent data and look at assignment uh, ownership. Um, which can be driven in part by legal uh, factors and may not reflect the actual management within the group. And then um, a second aspect of this is that communication technologies and management structure are choices made by the firm. And so therefore it's very difficult to understand, you know, what's driving what effects within that. So we go about this, we try to address these challenges in two ways. First on the data front, um, we, uh, gather the insight that transfer pricing reports of multinational firms actually have very rich detail uh, on the activities of the entities within the firm. And so in particular, we often think of strategic assets such as technologies, intellectual property as being kind of general assets of the firm as a whole, but in fact, multinational firms allocate control rights to different units and they formally do so with contracts between subsidiaries that are signed by executives of the subsidiary units that assign both control and income rights together to the units that manage those activities. So those owning units contract other entities within the firm to do R&D and they function as managers um, of the R&D activities. So they approve and fund R&D projects, they direct the R&D activities and they monitor them. 
And so governments require that firms document these in reports. And these are audited by, by uh, third parties. And they're also uh, used, um, is submitted to governments on both sides of the transaction. And so just to give a brief example of what do we mean by this? Um, this is an example from the data sets. This is a US headquartered multinational firm. It's a telecommunications company. The name has changed for anonymity. And it's uh, got a Swedish subsidiary that owns the rights to an antenna technology. Now, that Swedish subsidiary contracts with the Finnish subsidiary to perform R&D on its behalf. And in return, it will pay it a 12% return on its R&D costs. So if Finland, whether or not it innovates, gets a 12% return for its R&D activities. Sweden, as the managing unit, directs Finland on what to do. And if Finland invents the latest and greatest antenna technology, Sweden holds ownership rights over that, that innovation. And it can capture the income from that innovation and it's able to manage the manufacturing, distribution, sales, and so on of that. Now you may be thinking, wait, 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 I've heard about this before. I've heard about it in the news. I've heard about it with Senate hearings. Isn't this all tax avoidance? Now we're right there with you on that. And we look at our data. So this is data on 72 multinational firms in our data set that had foreign R&D activities. Now for these multinational firms, they're everything from the Fortune 500 firms that you can think about from pharmaceutical tech companies, manufacturing companies. Um, what we find is that 16% of the R&D entities within the firm hold ownership rights to the firm's strategic assets. So these are technologies, manufacturing processes, expertise, and know-how. 83.5% of the R&D entities do not hold ownership rights. They perform R&D on a contract basis. Now, when we look at the breakout of the types of owners, what we see is that the parent accounts for a quarter of those units that hold ownership rights and they contract with about 30% of the, the R&D units within the firm. Operational subsidiaries, which would be the typical management subsidiaries that we think about, they account for 55% of the units within the firm. And the tax haven units are only 3%. So it's actually relatively small. Now, um, what we did is that we focus on tax havens in a separate paper. For this paper, we're focusing on the operational subsidiaries and the parent. Now, I have some examples of contracts that we see between them. We see that they're doing the activities in accordance with the specifications of the owners um, and that we see the assignment of rights. And also this will be, this is in the paper um, examples of the transfer pricing reports and the type of direction of activities. The one thing to notice here is the second to last bullet. They're not just doing incremental innovation. They're also uh, innovating new products within there. Um, so, the second aspect, so that's on the data front, the second aspect is endogeneity. So we address this with the introduction of broadband communication. It's one of the most important changes in technologies for business organizations. Um, and this allowed for the first time video conferencing, two-way communication, faster data transfer. It's especially important for streaming videos and teleconferencing. And given the significant economic and social impact of this technology, it was rolled out because governments implemented plans to deploy it. So it was driven by governments. Um, we matched this data with USPTO patent data and we matched the patents based on inventor location to capture the innovation of the subsidiary units. Uh, and we employed a double difference and difference analysis to study the differences between them pre and post introduction of broadband technology because there may be unobserved differences between subsidiaries that are managed by the parent versus subsidiaries managed by other subsidiaries, we um, did a match sample analysis. And so we matched based on country, industry, subsidiary initial patents, and the pre-broadband introduction, average patent quantity, quality, co-invention, group citations, and a bunch of other factors. So we tried to match as closely as we could on them. All right, due to time, I'm gonna to get to the descriptives. So just looking at the raw data, what we see is that parent managed subsidiaries before the introduction of broadband were more innovative than subsidiary managed R&D units. Um, and this holds even if we look at those with only one managing unit, because there are some units within the firm that are managed by multiple entities. And then post broadband though, we see a flip in this relationship where subsidiary managed units are more innovative, both in the quantity 
as well as the quality, meaning the forward citations, so how impactful those innovations are, and it holds across this. If we look at bin scatter plots, we're on the horizontal axis, it's, um, axis, it's uh, the broadband communication penetration rate, and on the vertical axis, it's the um, number of innovations. What we see is that the red line is for subsidiaries managed by the parent, and the blue line is for subsidiaries managed by other subsidiaries. We see that as broadband penetration increases, subsidiaries managed by other subsidiaries become more innovative, whereas those that are managed by the parent, their innovation output declines as communication um, increases. Now, we, for a difference in difference analysis, we start out with just the full sample looking at R&D units, what is the impact of broadband? And as expected, we find a positive result, both on innovation quantity and quality. Then we look at a sample of only those subsidiaries that have one managing unit. And what we find is that subsidiaries managed by other subsidiaries have an 11.9% increase in quantity and an 18.2% increase in quality of innovation. But those managed by the parent, in comparison to those managed by subsidiaries, had 12.5% uh, reduction in their innovation. And we also see a 23.4% reduction in quality in comparison here. Now, oh, for the- You have two minutes left. Okay. So for the match sample results, we find a similar scenario, and I'm gonna skip across the graphs. Um, so we look at co-invention, we find that we don't find a difference in, in sole invention, but we do find it coming through co-invention. So those that are contracted by the parent um, have a less, uh, a less, a smaller change in, in collaborative activities. They also are less likely to integrate new knowledge. Now, when we looked at, is this driven by R&D spending? We do not find evidence of it being driven by R&D spending. And we looked at, you know, is this um, uh, just a feature of the parent not being part of the hub of R&D? So is this driven by decentralized R&D? Or, um, and we do not find evidence to support that. Um, and then we looked at, if this is about information processing constraints, then we would see that as it's more difficult to uh, facilitate collaboration and to manage the units, it would be um, associated with larger firms, as well as you know, greater technological distance where they may be reverting more to um, metrics to gauge projects rather than their understanding. And we see that it is associated with large firms and with greater distance from the parent. We also see it's associated with greater cultural distance from the parent and language differences, which again are you know, going to these uh, communication complexities. So these results are consistent with greater information processing demands constraining the parent's ability to leverage and broker collaboration um, and perform higher quality monitoring. And so with, with that, we contribute to the literature on ICTs and provide insight into how the management of innovation may actually uh, affect the overall returns to ICT adoption. And it suggests that the parent actually fails to fully leverage the increase in communication for coordinating collaboration and performing higher quality monitoring. And that this is the first empirical study to, to um, examine the effects of subsidiaries managing other subsidiaries. Existing proxies can't quite get at that sort of relationship. And what we find is that after the introduction of broadband, the subsidiary managed units um, have greater quantity and more impactful innovations. They're more likely to integrate new knowledge and be more collaborative than those managed by the parent. And from the property rights perspective, um, the existing research has talked about distortion in rights allocations between firms arising from relative financial positions, product market strength, and firm size. And basically the inefficiencies that result from value creation. We're looking within the firm and our results suggest that these distortions may arise from the emergence of new technologies where the parent's role for the overall governance of the firm may lead to a lack of adequate investment um, in coordinating knowledge and a reliance on control that can actually stifle innovation outcomes. And so with that, um, thank you. Thanks, Katie. Um, let's give uh, Katie and Cassidy and Louis, a uh, round of applause. Uh, virtually, Katie, if you want to stop sharing your screen, okay. Uh, let's give them a round of applause, and then uh, I'm going to invite Vikas. Uh, Vikas, you want to go ahead and start sharing your screen? 
whenever you're ready. All right, can you see my slides? Looks good. Okay. Perfect. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Asim. Uh, thank you to the Strategy Division uh, for this opportunity uh, to present uh, this work, uh, which is uh, titled Relatedness, Organization Structure, and Market Entry. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Mo Chen from the University of Maryland and Brian Wu uh, at the University of Michigan. Uh, what we're doing this paper, of course, is looking at market entry. We're doing this in a multi-divisional uh, firm context. Uh, the key innovation here, though, is what we have, uh, fortunately, is data that allows us to look at patterns and mechanisms that occur at the level of the individual uh, division. And so we're going to look not at the level of the firm, but down at the level of the individual uh, division. We're going to do this in the context of an industry shock, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a second. Uh, which is September 11th. So the September 11th uh, terrorist attacks, which are essentially a demand side change to the industry. And what we mean by that is essentially that after 9-11, there was a big change in customer preferences, particularly uh, when you're thinking about the preferences of different Department of Defense agencies for different products and services, but technology essentially remained the same. And so that's kind of what we're characterizing as a demand side shock. This is part of a broader stream of work that we have on adaptation to demand side change. It's a paper that we put away for, uh, started a few years ago, put away, but kind of brought back out. So still very much uh, work in progress. One of the things I wanted to uh, just highlight is the relevance of this idea of looking at uh, demand side shocks, particularly in uh, the context of what's going on uh, today. So if we think about industry change on the demand side, the current pandemic, right, huge impact of COVID-19 on the way that we work, obviously big impact on the uh, economy in many ways. But I think what's, what's important to highlight here is that COVID-19 in many ways is a shock to demand, right? So what this is doing is transforming customer preferences Right? And the way that we think about demand side change is not only is there a change in the aggregate level of demand, but perhaps more importantly, there's a change in the relative preference ordering that customers have for particular products or technologies. And so if we think about this idea of reshuffling product demand, what does it, what has the pandemic done? Well, overall, it's a negative shock, but what we see is if we look at particular industries, say transportation, manufacturing, retail, a big negative impact there, whereas there may be a positive impact in, in other sectors. And a lot of this positive impact comes from shifts in the way that uh, consumers operate, right? Many of us are, or most of us are probably now uh, working from home and this has implications for the types of products and services and the demand for those products and services uh, in, in the industry. And we see this Wall Street Journal pointing out that if we look at uh, retail and, and the retail sector, what is up year over year, things like home improvement, things like sporting goods, outdoor, uh, outdoor sporting uh, activities, what's down, things like, uh, things like apparel. And so if you're a company like Brooks Brothers dealing with uh, business uh, clothing, you're not, doing, you're not doing very well. If you're a company like Dick's, maybe, right, you can switch over to uh, things like at-home fitness and outdoor activities that are gonna offset some of this weakness in other parts uh, of your business. And so maybe just to highlight this idea, again, of demand shocks, right? This is a, a, a common occurrence. Uh, Mary Tripsis's uh, great work on the typesetting industry really focused on these big demand changes, right? What happened is you had these technology transitions, but ultimately these transitions didn't occur with a new technology, but rather with these discontinuities in preference in demand over time. And so maybe just to situate this paper, um, it's part of a larger stream of work uh, that uh, Brian and I have been working on, looking at uh, the uh, adaptation of firms to change on the demand side, paper on organization science, which looks at how within firm interdependencies shape the adaptation performance of firms uh, after, after demand shock. A paper uh, that recently came out in SMJ that's looking at the direction of firm adaptation. So do firms 
go down a path of novelty? Do they go down a path of extending their existing uh, uh, products and services? And how do interactions among different firm capabilities shape that? And what we're doing in this paper is a little bit different. So while the other two papers have been really focused at the firm level, what we're trying to do here is focus on this issue of division level market entry. And what we want to understand is how interactions among the divisions that exist inside a firm shape this path of entry uh, into new markets by the different divisions of a firm in the context uh, of a demand shock. So maybe just a little bit of background here. Um, we're thinking about uh, uh, firms often face these sorts of external shocks and what do these shocks imply? Some form of strategic change, which compels them to adapt to these new environmental conditions. And most accounts of adaptation suggest that this sort of change presents firms with the opportunity or need to enter these new markets. And the ability of firms to enter the right markets is closely intertwined with their ability to sustain competitive advantage over time. And the basic story here is a well-known story. Capabilities are going to play a role in determining the path of market entry. Why is that? This poor mechanism that entering related markets lets firms deploy some of these capabilities that may be underutilized in a particular setting to capture opportunities that arise in, this, in these new settings. And so what we kind of identify is that there's some common assumptions in this literature that talks about the link between capabilities and market entry. And one is that we're, we, a lot of this literature, uh, much of this literature thinks about the firm operating as if it were simply a unitary actor. And so the capabilities that firms get from experience are gonna accrue at the firm level. Market relatedness is what determines entry, but we're really thinking about all of these uh, capabilities as, as being firm level characteristics. And so kind of maybe the starting research question here is to, is to think about how does this capabilities to entry link operate when we start to think about the divisional level within a multi-divisional level firm, right? So what does this mean when we think about these different division level interactions? The actual entry into these new markets is carried out uh, by these individual divisions. And of course, these firm level strategy considerations are closely intertwined with these interactions that occur among the various divisions inside the firm. And what we're gonna to try to do here is to bridge uh, these literatures on organization design and firm capabilities. Um, a lot of this work goes back to some of the classics uh, uh, like Chandler, lots of work on diversification that points to some of these division level factors that shape the ways in which firms uh, diversify. Lots of great work looking at things like uh, divisional charters, the scope of product market activities uh, in, inside firms. But really the gap is even though we have these theoretical advances, uh, there's actually limited evidence on the entry patterns of individual divisions uh, within a firm. And so what we're gonna try to do is to really look at some of what happens at the firm level and propose some theoretical reasons why we might uh, uh, see some of these patterns. And so it's a huge body of literature and organization design that, uh, that, that we build on. And I'm obviously not gonna go, go, go through it here, but just to, to highlight it uh, very quickly. Um, why, why, why is this kind of interesting? Well, when we look at these flows of information in, inside firm boundaries, right? This is what essentially firms are managing is these interdivisional interactions, these recombination benefits that uh, arise if divisions uh, that wouldn't be possible if divisions were independent uh, of one another. There are these underlying interdivisional dynamics involving competition for resources, the coordination of activities among divisions that are going to come into play. And these interdivisional interactions are going to create both positive and negative spillovers. And so the behavior of any particular unit is going to affect uh, the performance and the behavior uh, of the other. And so these different cross-divisional interactions are going to influence this ongoing process of, of adaptation to change. So kind of the way that we've organized this paper and we kind of thought, thought about what's, what's the best way to, to approach this, do we have formal hypotheses, do we view this as more, more exploratory, is given that there's a lack of empirical research that really looks at the issue of market entry at the division level, we want to conduct an exploratory study to understand the patterns of division level market entry over time. And we're gonna do this in the context of September 11th. And this context has, has several advantages, one is partially some of the endogeneity issues are, 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 are solved. We have this unexpected change, which allows us to dis disentangle 
pre-shock capabilities that were built up from the post-shock diversification choices that are made. Uh, we, it also lets us uh, focus really on the demand side, which is what we're interested in. So we can hold technology constant and try to unpack some of these demand side mechanisms that come into play in shaping uh, division level uh, market entry over time. Our starting point is to think about what happens at the firm level, right? Related market experience influences firm uh, market entry. We know that. And we want to try to understand to what degree does this uh, apply at the level of the individual division. And then kind of ex post, try to understand what are some of the mechanisms that might be occurring, do some post hoc theorizing combined with some supplemental empirical analyses to understand what might be uh, going on here. And so the conduct, maybe sort of conceptually to lay out what we're looking at, right? Imagine that we have two divisions within a firm and these divisions previously prior to the shock uh, uh, operate in these two different markets, M1 and M2. And imagine that there's a third market which the firm has not yet entered. That might be less related to M1, but more related to, to M2. And so the question that we're gonna ask is, right? What is a propensity of entry uh, by D1 into this M3 new market? even though the other division has more related experience, right? Why would we see that? What could be an explanation? What might be some of the mechanisms that drive the first division, which has less related experience to enter that, uh, that new market M3? And so the empirical context uh, that we're gonna look at is September 11th, right? Exogenous demand side uh, change to the defense industry. And what this essentially did is it caused the defense industry to move away from this Cold War mindset to one in which security and counterterrorism concerns are much more salient. And so essentially what we had as a result of the September 11th events was an aggregate increase in overall demand together with this very sudden shift in customer preferences by the Department of Defense with respect to uh, particular uh, technologies. And so the aggregate effect was big, right? This is kind of overall Department of Defense procurement data, uh, which uh, increased markedly in the years following uh, 2001. And again, what's more important in the context of the demand, uh, of a demand side change is to show that there's actually this reshuffling. Certain markets that may have been negative in the pre-shock period are now positive. Those that were positive might be, by, might be negative. So if we look at this two by two of uh, negative versus positive growth pre and post shock, what we really wanna see is that there's a lot of this stuff that's on the off diagonal, right? So that's where we're gonna see these altered product market growth conditions when we go from the pre 2001 period to the post 2001 period. We're gonna draw on Department of Defense procurement data. And one of the benefits of that data is that there's this natural classification system that allows us to understand what products are related to what other products. We use what are called product service codes, which are these four digit codes, which also exist within this more higher level hierarchy, this two digit pro product uh, classification system, right? So if we think about different types of engines, rocket engines and components, gasoline, rotary engines, both of these might be different product service codes, but they exist within this uh, broader two digit code uh, uh, number 28. We're gonna look at 86 publicly traded firms over this 11 year period, looking at these pre-shock characteristics which we, for which we pool contract data, the experience that these firms had in this uh, uh, five year uh, period before the shock. And what we're gonna look at is the division market year level of analysis. So the division is gonna be the actual unit to which these contracts were awarded. The market is that particular product market, the PSC code, uh, which is gonna be entered. And then we're gonna focus on this adaptation following uh, the shock in the years 2002 to 2006. Uh, uh, variables here is because uh, you have like two minutes left. Yeah, so the the, the in indicator of variable for division market entry, um, which is a value uh, of one for the year in which the focal division operates in the focal product market uh, new to the firm. And the key explanatory variables that, that we're gonna look at are, does the focal division have some experience in this, uh, in a related market, or does its sister uh, division have some related market uh, experience uh, prior to the shop? Gonna control for a bunch of stuff at the division level, firm level, product market level, run this uh, using, using logit models with clustered standard errors. And kind of uh, the, the kind of key insight uh, here, kind of very baseline insight is that uh, of course the focal divisions likely of entry 
increases when the unit has already operated in a related market. But interestingly, uh, the focal division's likelihood of entry increases when it has a sister uh, division that's already operating and that has already operated in that related market. And the focal division's likelihood of entry, this focal division effect is larger than, in magnitude than the sister effect. And what we then try to do is understand what are some of the reasons why this might be happening? Are there mechanisms that could create more cooperation or more competition among divisions? And we, we focus here on the shared presence of a customer between uh, the focal, for, uh, focal division uh, and the system in the pre-contract -con period. And we also look at the concentration of the market, right? When you have a more concentrated market, the rent that accrues to these capabilities uh, is going to be greater. And so the, there may be more competitive effects in these more uh, concentrated markets. And in fact, uh, that's, that's what we find is that the presence of a shared uh, customer between the focal firm and focal division and the sister increases uh, the propensity of entry into this uh, uh, related market. And the market concentration actually uh, has a much more competitive effect, which is going to dissuade the sister division from entering uh, this related market. So what does this uh, work do? It advances our understanding of these division level paths of diversification, which is something which is usually defined at the firm level, allows us to decompose these related markets into more fine grained markets that are specific to each division, gaining uh, deeper insight into the mechanisms that under underlie these diversification processes and broadens our understanding of firm adaptation to uh, industry change. Right? Decentralization is great because it allows divisions the autonomy to broadly explore, but you need to reintegrate this knowledge and you need to also deal with this fact that there may be resistance among these divisions due to these interdivisional competitive uh, barriers. So thanks very much. Okay, thanks Vikas. Um... Let's give Vikas uh, and Mo, who's here as well, uh, a round of applause. Um, before we move on to, uh, I'm gonna ask Colin Marco to, to do his discussion comments. Before we do that though, uh, I wanna, since we, you know, let's be honest, we all really act, serve social media now more than we serve anything else. Uh, I'm going to uh, take a, 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 a screenshot. Uh, and so I'm going to ask uh, if you're okay doing that, if you can turn on your videos and smile for the camera. You, actually, you don't have to smile for the camera. You can look glum in if you want to. That's really the image you want to project, but turn on your videos in any case. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to count to three. I'm still watching some videos come on. I'm going to count to three and then I'm going to take a, a, a screenshot uh, okay, so one, two, and three. Thank you. Uh, and 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 Marco, um, you can. Oh, okay, can, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Let me share the uh, there is the the screen that I I have some slide for you. Uh, so first of all, uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, for me, it, it's really a pleasure to be to be here and also to see all this community coming together. And uh, also for me, it's, it's very it's very a pleasure to see a, a lot of friends uh, online or on Zoom. Uh, let me move uh, to the uh, to the sort of uh, general view of, of all the papers, and then I have some comments for each one of the paper. Uh, this is my view about the, the, the new trends that it, it, is, uh, it is the title also of this, of this symposium. Uh, first of all, I would like to, uh, to comment the fact that we see a stream of new data or new variable that uh, uh, before were quite impossible to have. And uh, this is incredible and we have seen incredible data in this, in this paper and uh, from more a general uh, research point of view, what, what we are doing now is transforming something that was an, an omitted variable in something that now we can observe and we can uh, measure. Uh, but maybe we want to discuss a little bit more what bias we have in having previously this particular variable as, a, as an omitted variable. And then what is this variable for the theory? Because the variable per se could be very interesting, but theory-wise, maybe we have to build a little bit more around uh, this variable. Uh, meaning that uh, 
I think we are in a, in a very explorative uh, uh, moment of the research in corporate strategy in which uh, we have a sort of trade-off between uh, maybe this omitted variable was, was something that we already know, or we are using maybe too much abduction because we really don't know what uh, this uh, variable is, uh, is, is measured. The second point is uh, what I call the elephant in the room in corporate strategy, uh, because I think we have this big question about the organizational structure, that I think it is a overlooked aspect in corporate strategy, and I think because of lack of data and because it's very difficult to have uh, uh, the organizational design variable across time, across company in the same data set. Uh, but we have a lot of questions that should be answered in terms of uh, what does uh, a particular hierarchy uh, create in terms of decision making. Uh, if the business units are uh, coordinating or are fighting each other, and what are the costs or the real cost to coordinate a flat or a vertical structure? And especially if there are fights, what are the costs of these fights? And I think that uh, I, will, I would like to say that one of the future of, of this uh, line of research will be to say a little bit more, especially empirical, on the empirical side about the, uh, the, the, the organization of that. Another big point I think is the relatedness, and we, we, we heard about this in these papers, and, uh, but what is related, relatedness, I think we need to, to, from one side, agree on this point, and on the other, maybe try to have a more broad definition, because traditionally relatedness is, is a sort of supply side measure, but what about when we are talking about fungible resources that create relatedness, that are not production resources, uh, like, for example, uh, intangible technology like algorithms uh, or brains. Uh, and I think that we should a little bit uh, define better, especially in terms of resource-based view in, in terms of, of application of the resources, what is uh, uh, related. And finally, I think that uh, all our debate is about uh, the presence of cost and the presence of synergies, uh, most of the time I think we focus on the cost part, uh, maybe because are better, it, it's easier to measure it. Uh, I think the synergies are more complicated, uh, but I think that our view in terms of corporate strategy could not be complete if we, we are able, if we are not able to integrate together uh, cost and synergy. And as a final point, uh, is that uh, I see, personally, I see that there is a, a wonderful and a very uh, alive research in corporate strategy. I think that from the, let me say, more the, on the diffusion part of the textbook, and uh, especially when I have to go in the classroom to teach, uh, there is a huge distance between uh, what is in the textbook and our discussion today, uh, and maybe we want to, uh, in some sort, to, to, to close this gap uh, between what we know and what uh, we teach. Say that, let me go quickly on the paper. The first one is the one of Emily. Uh, as I say, all the papers are very great. I learn a lot, and I, I have a wonderful idea also in terms of my research reading this paper. Uh, uh, the first point is about uh, uh, this, this variable that is, that, that is used, uh, the, the, the TSA, uh, that in the past, I think, in this literature was an omitted variable. Again, maybe you want to discuss a little bit better what bias uh, uh, were introduced in the past uh, if we don't look at this variable. And uh, in terms of uh, uh, identification, you tend to identify the cost with, uh, with the antecedents. And so maybe you want to anticipate in the paper what you really can observe and uh, what uh, you can really mm, measure uh, with your data. Another uh, thing that pop up in my mind is that uh, if uh, this disclosure or not disclosure is affecting more the variance uh, than uh, the, the level of, of, of market reaction. Uh, hypothesis one, hypothesis two, to me, it seems more a sort of uh, uh, continuous hypothesis on, on the intensity of the effect 
maybe you want to clarify why you separated in two hypotheses. I think that your paper have incredible, incredible results for the functioning of the financial market. And maybe you, you want to, 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 to sell better these incredible, these incredible results. And uh, this is a thing that basically was not clear to me when reading the paper is that it seems to me that when a company creates a spin-off in some, in some ways moving out from the hierarchy, something, something new. And so it, it clearly becomes more clear for the, for the financial market. And so why a firm that decides to make a spin-off then it wants to uh, keep secret some information and uh, maybe some um, more qualitative type of information, it's very important. Uh, I have a couple of comments also on the empirics. Uh, uh, that the main comment, I think that for me, it's very interesting why companies make a spin-off, then they decide not to disclose. And uh, for me, uh, strategically, it's, it's really even maybe more interesting than to know what is the effect of the people or the company that disclose. And maybe a little bit more of a story or narrative about what do the investor really read about this in the sense, do they really check that there is a TSA? Do they really check inside the document which information there is or there is not? Because this could help a lot to uh, put a narrative on, on, on your story. Uh, about the matching, uh, uh, there is a huge debate about the matching technology. I'm not entering here, but maybe you want to or provide other type of, of, of uh, regression results or be a little bit more compelling of why this matching is, is the right one. As a final uh, uh, issue is, uh, I was wondering if uh, this is a story more of people, of company that are penalized if they don't disclose or company that they receive a, a, an award if they disclose. And, uh, is still uh, to me a sort of, of question mark. And in terms of uh, abduction here, I think is that uh, uh, costs are the main mechanism, but costs are not observed. What is observed the, is the T TSA, and, and maybe you want to, to, to anticipate this a, a little bit early. Marco, uh, I think that it's a great paper again. Uh, I think you need to really to be a little bit more pushy on the novelty of your paper especially in terms of all the past knowledge we know about the fact that learning experience helps a lot in terms of merger acquisition, meaning that it's true that you are measuring something new, but theory-wise, are you measuring something new in the sense that it's your story difference of a classical story of uh, alliances to inventors that helps to close an M&A? In terms of data, clearly clear data, Great data, sometimes also a little bit scary from my point of view. Um, sample selection issue, uh, you select on m and and so you want to be clear in the paper what is your baseline and, uh, and why there are not company with interaction but no m &As. Quite surprising to me the number of visits, it's four. I was, uh, I, I was expecting a huge number and, and to me four, it, it's, it's a very, it's, it's, a, it's a very uh, uh, low number. Uh, I was wondering if I had to acquire a company, I, I visit only four times on average. And especially it's quite surprising to me that zero, in the sense, uh, how come that uh, uh, you never visit a company that you buy? Uh, in the sense that maybe you want to, to clarify better the extent of this data. And the other point is that I was wondering if, you know, visits, it's a sort of uh, a scanning strategy when I, in which I visit several potential targets and then I decide which one to buy, but it does not seem that is the story of your paper here. So they are not using this interaction as a scanning tool. Uh, and generally speaking, you, especially in the front end, you talk a lot about competition, but then in the paper, I don't see too much competition going on, both in the theory and in the, in the, in the data. Kathy, uh, this is a, a one uh, for me very interesting because it was uh, basically one of my uh, first paper uh, related to this, uh, to this literature. Uh, the first thing is if you are able to challenge a little bit more the consolidated view on, in IB and R&D, 
both in terms of the traditional view a la Rambudambi or a John Cantwell, but also more in light of the strategic view a la Juan Alcácer, in the sense in the strategic use of knowledge uh, of subsidiary and in court. Um, and indeed, I think that uh, the role of hierarchy here uh, should be better highlighted because I think it's one of the uh, plus of your paper. Uh, I know that there is a huge debate about the patents, uh, the ownership, uh, the location, uh, if it is true that the address of the inventor, the address of the quarter, the address of subsidiary is where the R&D was conducted. And you maybe uh, want to, 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 to address a little bit the point. And another, uh, another suggestion is, uh, since now it's very fashion to use uh, machine learning to go into the patent text, maybe you can use it to have a little bit more of information if there is some strategic way of writing patents in a different way uh, in, into the different context before or after the shock. Uh, aga uh, uh, about the transfer pricing and the tax avoidance, uh, you already commented during the presentation, so I'm not, uh, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not uh, uh, talking uh, about this point. But maybe in terms of measuring the hierarchy, the position of the subsidiaries, I know that there are uh, consolidated measures used in the literature, and maybe you want to confront uh, this measure with your measure. Finally, Vikram, uh, theory, again, as I, as, I, as I discussed in the first slide, I think that uh, the organizational variable and the organizational dimension is key uh, for the future of this research community. Uh, I have a lot of big questions, meaning that uh, when you have the focal subsidiary, which is the real, the variable that is important in your particular context, uh, the proximity, the position, uh, who is the, the, the business unit that control the key uh, variable uh, that, or the key resources that create the competitive advantage, who is taking decision and when and what is the flows information. And uh, I think that uh, we, we have a, a lot of, uh, a, a of factors going on now. Maybe you want to, to, to address clearly why in your particular context some variable are important and some why other variable are not. More generally, I hope that in this type of research, we can uh, uh, go beyond dummies and so to try to move more the variables towards a sort of a continuous variable. And again, as I, as, I, as I say in the first slide, the issue of relatedness, what is related in your context and how, how we can, let me say, move the theory of relatedness away or in a more fine grain compared to how we measure relations. And uh, say that, uh, I'm stopping here. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I think the floor is yours, no? Thank you, Marco. And thanks, really great set of comments. Uh, I, I think uh, a lot to, a lot to hopefully, you know, very useful to the authors as well. And, and I think just, I just want to echo, I think, the point about it's so great to see such, you know, detailed work getting into the inner workings of both corporate transactions and acquisitions and spin-offs, as well as getting into the details of what uh, our, uh, you know, corporate structure actually looks like. Uh, so I want to thank once again, uh, all four of our presenters and, and their co-authors. Uh, and I want to give a shout out to, to Gwen, who is hiding behind her SDI division tag, but is really the mover and shaker behind all of this. You can see the sort of icebergs broken behind her from, from the wake that she's breaking. And, and Tim, of course, uh, uh, as, as our, uh, actually no, no longer my fearless leader, but the SDR division's fearless leader uh, for, for the opportunity to put this together. It's been really, really wonderful seeing so many familiar faces and, and getting to reconnect uh, at this moment. Uh, we don't really, we're pretty much out of time, so I'm not gonna open it up for questions. Uh, I think we've already had, uh, you know, a very active discussion and chat, but thank you all for being here. Uh, and if I don't see you, which I probably won't before, before the new year, have a wonderful, safe and wonderful holiday season. Uh, and, and, and look at the bright side, 2021 has to be better, right? So happy new year is pretty much guaranteed at this point, hopefully.
uh, but but hopefully we'll get to see. Uh, please please take look take a look at the uh, stronger together calendar. Uh, come for the next virtual symposia. Come to the meet the scholar discussions. Come to all the other cool events that that the team is organizing. Uh, and I hope to see you uh, uh, all there in the next in the new year. Uh, Gwen, did you have anything you want to add? Oh, no, just to keep uh, track of the six more that are coming in 2021. We will have a lot of fun together. Happy holidays. Thanks. Bye, everyone.